Hello, this is Mr. Zamoyski, chemistry teacher at North Tonawanda High School, and this is the pre-lab video for the second core lab titled Heat of Fusion. Uh, we're going to look at phase changes with water once again, as we did with the heating curve of H2O lab last quarter. Um, we looked at the range of phase changes and temperature changes that occur when you go from ice to water to steam. Here specifically, we're going to look at the phase change from ice to water and the energy associated with that. Uh, so before we get started, let's just do a recap of some ideas with energy and phase changes. This plot here represents an ideal heating curve of H2O. Uh, what happens is in this flat light region here, this represents the solid to liquid phase change or melting, also known as fusion. Um, this region of a steep incline is the liquid phase. Then when we get to this flat line at the top here, this is the phase change from liquid to gas known as vaporization or boiling. Um, if we were to extend this before the solid liquid change, we would have just solid. And then after the liquid gas phase change, we would have just gas. Um, this is a little bit different in shape uh, than your graph that you got because theoretically all the energy from the Bunsen burner should go into causing the phase change to occur here. Um, but you had sort of more of a curved line like this. And the reason is um, in real life, the heat doesn't decide what it goes to, whether it's the ice or the water. It just goes to it, and then whatever's nearby absorbs it. When you were doing this lab, the amount of energy you were adding, or the amount of heat you were adding, was the same throughout the entire process, but we had different behaviors on our scatter plot here, uh, depending on whether a phase change or a drastic temperature change was occurring. We have three equations that we've looked at that model energy transfer uh, specifically for water. They're in table T of your reference tables. And we have one that involves a specific heat capacity of water and a temperature change, uh, one that involves a heat of fusion, and one that involves a heat of vaporization. And these correspond to different regions of the graph. When we have uh, no temperature change occurring at the solid liquid phase, we use this equation where the energy transferred is equal to the mass of your sample times the heat of fusion. In the middle region here, when we have the drastic temperature increase, the energy transferred is equal to the mass of the sample times the specific heat capacity of water times the change in temperature. And then when we have our phase change from liquid to gas at the top, then the energy transferred is equal to the mass of the sample times the heat of vaporization. For this lab, we're specifically going to look at this equation here. The energy that's transferred to ice when it melts or to water when it freezes. For this lab, we won't be working with any dangerous chemicals. We're just dealing with ice and water again. So there aren't any SDS to read for this lab. We are going to be working with heat and glassware though. So we're going to need to wear our goggles as always. Whenever we're working with heat, glassware, chemicals, our goggles are essential. The purpose of this lab is to determine the heat of fusion of H2O, or the energy that it takes to melt a sample of ice or to freeze a sample of water. What we're going to do is we're going to take a sample of warm water, get a specific amount of it, and then add ice to it. The temperature change of the warm water as it cools down we'll use that to determine how much energy was required to melt the ice that we put in the first place. So let's go ahead and get started. To start off this lab, we're going to take a sample of water and heat it. We're going to need a hot plate, a beaker of water, and to record temperature, we're going to use this device known as a LabQuest. It is a digital device made by Vernier that allows us to measure temperature and a bunch of other things. Um, if we end up having issues with this, we'll just go to our standard uh, bulb thermometers. So what we'll do is we're going to heat this to a specific temperature. Our target temperature is going to be 50 degrees Celsius. So we'll come back when this is ready to go. Looks like I overshot my temperature a little bit, but that's OK. All that matters is that we record the initial temperature when we start the next part. So now that we have our warm water, we're going to take it off and do the next part. 
Now that I have my warm water, I'm going to transfer exactly 100 milliliters to a graduated cylinder. I'm going to use the rubber hands to help me do this transfer so that I don't burn myself. I went a little bit over, so I'm going to use a pipette to help me get to 100 milliliters. Now that I have 100 milliliters of water, I'm going to transfer it to a styrofoam cup. Then I'm going to stick my vernier probe in it and record the temperature. My temperature appears to have leveled off at 55.3 degrees Celsius. So that'll be my starting temperature. A couple notes here. Um, we're going to be adding ice and stirring it. I'm going to give you a glass stirring rod to use. Use that instead of the probe. Uh, the probe is sensitive and can break easily. Secondly, you're going to press the play button to get the probe to record temperatures over time. And it'll be easier to see the temperature level off, which is our ultimate goal here. If you have questions about that, your instructor will show you how to do it. What you'll do now is you're going to add ice. and then you're going to gently stir it. You should see a rapid spike downwards in the temperature. If it looks like you're about to lose all of your ice because it's melting, go ahead and add, an up, add a couple more cubes. You always want ice present in here, and you're gonna keep adding ice and letting it melt and then adding more ice until your temperature levels off. Once your temperature is leveled off, mine has at about 0.9 degrees Celsius. What you'll do is you'll take the probe out of the water and you're going to stop the collection of data. Um, then what you'll do is you're going to take your sample of ice and water. There still should be some ice in there. And what you're going to do is you're going to remove the ice without losing much of the water. So go ahead and grab it, shake the water off, and then either return the ice or you can just throw it in the sink. What we'll do next is you're going to measure the volume of water you have now. It will be the 100 milliliters you started with plus however much ice is melted. Because you have more water than you started with, and we're only using a 100 milliliter beaker, measure out 100 milliliters, then discard it, and then come back and measure the remainder of the water. So now I'm at 100 milliliters plus 61.5. That's all the data collection. Now let's go and do the calculations. I have my values that I've recorded from my measurements. I have the final temperature of the ice water mixture, which was the temperature when it leveled off when you had ice and water in it, which was 0.9 degrees Celsius for me. I have my initial volume of water, which was the warm water that I poured into the graduated cylinder, and I measured exactly 100 milliliters of that. And then my final volume, which is the initial water, plus any ice that melted and turned into water, which gave me 161.5 milliliters. I had an initial temperature that I recorded, but the sample was continuing to cool down a little bit before I put the ice in. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to your lab quest and find the uh, data that it uses to plot your results. And you're going to look for the temperature that's steady before there's a sharp decrease. So if I look over here, I have a temperature of 54.5, which I have highlighted there, and then it starts to go down pretty quickly, 53.3 at the next collection point, 
49.9 and then 44. Um, so I'm going to use 54.5 as my initial temperature. I'm going to subtract these two temperatures to get my delta T. I'm going to subtract the two volumes to get my change in volume. I'm going to use the density of water to convert from milliliters of water to grams of water because ultimately we're going to use our energy transfer equation, and we need mass. And we know that density is the relationship between mass and volume. So we can convert between mass and volume using the density. Um, so from these results, we know uh, the specific heat of water from your reference tables. And what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the energy transferred, um, divide it by the mass of the water, and you'll be able to figure out the heat of fusion, which is a measurement in joules per gram. That's the end of the pre-lab video for the heat of fusion lab. Make sure to answer your pre-lab questions, read over the procedure, and make sure you're properly dressed when you come to do this lab. Have a great day.